Maya was born in Latvia and she remembers the Latvian Paragi at Christmas time, traveling to Nicaragua together. And she made the point that one time she was always doing amazing things. She would always update them with postcards and she would always send them emails telling them what she was doing. Them. And this one is lovely where she said that she took her first solo trip down to Costa Rica and Maya insisted on taking the bus with her just to turn around and go back to Nicaragua. So a devoted grandmother. And she's just so grateful that, as she said, her, her grandmother had a fiery soul and passionate heart and noted that she'd always be close to her heart, reminding her to be brave, honest, intelligent and strong. So a beautiful tribute from a granddaughter who was totally inspired by her. Um, that was one of the last steering council meetings that I think um, Maya attended. And just to recognize that her, her spirit continues, and I'll try my Spanish, hasta la victoria siempre. <laughs> And just saying to her, rest in peace, I think she has inspired another generation, not just her grandchildren, but many other young people. So that's Maya. Thank you. Please do note 
that the Constitution says the and not a directing and coordinating authority. The 60s and the 70s were the Cold War period, with then the Soviet Union and the United States vying with each other to assume leadership. It was also the area of disease control, when health systems were primarily designed to control infectious diseases through what were known as vertical programs. Dr. Mahler and some of his colleagues sensed the widespread dissatisfaction with top-down systems that had little place for local communities and in more low- and middle-income countries were driven by Western perceptions and priorities. Working in colleagues, with colleagues in WHO and in tandem with Henry Lowe's, then Executive Director of UNICEF, Dr. Mahler was responsible for crafting the primary health care approach to address health holistically. Dr. Mahler and his colleagues adroitly and negotiated contradictory perceptions to the then bipolar globe and produced the Declaration on Primary Health Care, ratified in 1978 by 131 member states of the World Health Organization, gathered in the former Kazakh capital, Almaty. The primary health care approach was both elegant in its simplicity and startling bold in the sweep of its vision. At its core, the approach stressed the importance of allocating most focus and resources to the community and to the primary level. Clinics and health centers, where the people live, where they work, where they fall ill, and first seek care. The declaration defined primary health care as essential health care based on practical, scientifically sound, and socially accessible methods and technologies made universally accessible to individuals and families in the community through their full participation and at a cost that the community and the country can afford to maintain at every stage of their development in the spirit, spirit of self-reliance and self-determination. Later in life, Dr. Mahler would lament the delusion of the vision of primary health care and that approach as a consequence of both the medicalization of primary health care through the introduction of selective child survival initiatives and the imposition of conservative economic policies, structural adjustment programs in the global south and also in the north by international agencies such as the World Bank and the IMF. He commented, when people are mere pawns in an economic and profit-growing game, that game is mostly lost for the underprivileged. However, he remained optimistic about the intellectual and visionary power of the approach. He began his address in, that, in 2008 to the World Health Assembly by quoting Milan Kundera. The struggle against human oppression is the struggle between memory and forgetfulness. He ended his address by saying, and so, being an inveterate optimist, I do believe that the struggle between memory and forgetfulness can be won in favor of the Alma the Health for All vision and in related primary health care strategies. Dr. Mahler remained a champion of primary health care and of people's movements striving to make a, that vision a reality. Many health activists will recall his towering presence at the National Health Assembly in Kolkata in Dosmin and subsequently in Dhaka at the First People's Health Assembly. He was also, which, which was the precursor of the People's Health Movement, he was also an active participant in the second People's Health Assembly in Cuenca, Ecuador in 2005 and said in an interview given to the People's Health Movement in 2007, listen carefully, 
The People's Health Movement is the only movement that understands and works toward comprehensive primary health care, unlike other so civil society networks who focus on specific diseases. With Dr. Mahler's passing, the movement for creating a just and equitable society where health is not a commodity but a universal right has lost a great thinker, a dear friend, and a comrade in arms. Today, the World Health Organization has been reduced to a mere pawn of both rich countries which have started of its resources and the private corporations and foundations which promote commercialized and techno technocratic solutions to health programs rooted in growing inequities. At this sad time, it's worth recalling WHO's constitution which states, the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic or social condition. <coughs> Viva health and Viva. And now I want to share with you something about primary health care Prior to the al the Declaration, some people think that primary health care began with al -Nata. Well, Safrula and I come from struggles for national liberation. And in our countries, this kind of work with primary health care was being done from the mid-60s in Central and some places in South America long before anybody thought of Almata. We were, in Central America, we began training community health promoters in the 1960s, in different countries of Central America. And many of us were separated from one another, we didn't know one another, but finally we were able to come together in 1975. 1975, three years before Alma'aka, we formed a network of people who were working with community health workers, not with our governments. Our governments were military dictatorships, and the kind of work that we were doing was seen as subversive. And I suppose in retrospect, it really was, right? Because we were talking about health for all the people. And in our countries, many people were marginalized, many people had no access, there were no rural health services, there were barely any public health services at all. So we trained community health workers during those years. Many of them were women, especially women, who were working as midwives. And midwives in our indigenous communities of Latin America, many of them are seen as sacred workers, people who have the sacred role to perform in, to, uh, perform in their communities. So, those of us who were working on those programs in the different countries of Central America and Mexico felt that the Amahata Declaration was the answer to our prayer because now governments were saying we should be carrying out primary health care as governments. And we really believed that things would move forward. But soon what happened is selective primary health care came into the picture, and we'll hear more about that later. But I want to tell you that over the years, with people from Central America, people from other parts of the world, like Africa, like Asia, people sitting at this table, three of us sitting at this table, and people in this audience came together in a meeting in Nicaragua in 1991. 1991, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And our meeting was, we had dreamed of a way that 
that we who were struggling for a different, a different way of looking at this world, of a world where there would be socialist goals and not capitalist goals, we suddenly were left with, what are we going to do now? How can we be assured that in this new phase, not the phase that we had dreamed of, how can we should be assured that primary health care will go forward? So we formed the International People's Health Council. That was in 1991. That was a small, small network of, of socially and politically committed people from all around the world. It was small, but we made an impact. And we had meetings in different places. We had the first international meeting to ever be held in Palestine. And then later on, we had a meeting in South Africa, immediately after the fall of apartheid. So, this network, this network of committed health activists from around the world was one of the eight organizations that was responsible for setting up the first People's Health Assembly in the year 2000. We didn't start in the year 2000. We started way back in 97 and 98, preparing for the first People's Health Assembly. But that's all history. That's something that's really important for us to know. There are many young activists here. It's important for you to know what is the real history. You need to study the history of the health movements around the world. So now I want to have my comrades share with us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Maria Julia, letting us know the contribution of uh, Dr. Mohale and this great judge for contributing the first movement, and as well as as she said, the small initiative how it can impact it. And the contribution she has made in uh, Health Assembly in 2000. So that was I uh, want to now thank her. Now we have another champion globally, Dr. Zafrullah Chowdhury, who is among the who established Established in 1972, it started a journey from the war field, which is a great, uh, you know, we must say that pride of us that from the war field is, he has started his work. And the great coalition he made, basically instrumental in the formation of Bangladesh drug policy, national drug policy, in 82. And he has a huge successes, implementation of which to make Bangladesh near self reliant in the production of essential medicine and it in the availability and affordability. This is the, there is a lot of public sectors, pharmaceuticals, but what he has made, the conscious of pharmaceuticals, you will not find any advertisement in the public. So we, as we know, the production, advertisement costs 60% of medicine. So that's why his medicine is not a public domain, but uh, it is for the people and the local. So I would like to humbly request Dr. Zabrullo Chaudhuri to address the this is On this occasion, I really I use words. I don't know how to begin. The people, the frontiers of capitalism, colonial fathers, colonial histories, they all have got one character in common. They know how to bury the truth and to mislead the people, to misguide the professionals. Professionals are one of the most blind people. 
they try to find out the aid of this equilibrium being by God and other words they are a blind man trying to find out the exact path in the dark road. The previous occasion you have heard how the professionals talk about the problems. Everybody is everything is other people's fault. Everything is politicians' fault. And they are all the same. After one hour, half an hour talk, they are very sick. They do not have the minimum courtesy to learn. But at the end of they are the title of opposites. So that is the world's global problem. So if you want to talk about Amata, we have to go there into history a little bit. 1970s, in the period of struggle, human institution and social advance of socialism. You all have to remember that. 1970s, first is the freedom of Bangladesh. We armed our freedom. We armed the armed struggle, taking the people out. We armed freedom from orthodoxy. I don't go into much into but we earn our freedom. Soon after, Vietnam arms freedom. That only the whole capitalist world. And the Asia, all on a sudden, there's a dark world. They never thought that the small Vietnamese would really defeat the mighty US. They did. So this is the indicate when the socialism was coming in. Capitalists are so clever. When they saw the new sun, the rise of sun in the eastern horizon on the western front, they had a very nice and clever plan. That's the one plan, I am at another. They are taking a new way. What is the new way? The higher of the best friends, including socialists, the higher as their economists, the higher with the high salary than other. They are friends. <coughs> so they were having the idea of how to tackle this. That is the background of that thing. What give a new vision? Like me, I'm a master surgeon. I'm always being attended by other people. It's like that. And then we, we talk like operation theater. We don't call it operation room, operation room. It's like a drama is going to be formed. So that's such a famous fact. All of a sudden, during the war, we realize Better with is a different era. It's not a population theater. It needs the people, community. You cannot wait for the professionals to appear from the heaven and they will give the service to the people. That is the time we saw how the power of the people. We are women with two to four weeks training, which I have learned in five years. She learned it in two to four weeks and gave the same sorts of assistant detail they just me in the operating room, operating theater. So that opened our eyes. What is opened eyes? We have to demedicalize the healthcare. If we want to give the healthcare to the people, people have to be empowered with themselves. The, the, the special what is it's the women in the game. We have seen women. So that is the time we realize, especially men like me in a Bangladesh, country like Bangladesh, a Muslim Orthodox country. Our rest of the country with destiny depends on two things. If the poor, if their faith improves, country progress. And if the progress of the women will decide the destiny of the country. They have to be involved everywhere. And the women must be made visible in a Muslim country. 
That's why Dhanu Shastra Tandra was started. They trained the women in every strand. Boiler operator, without it, we realized so long women would be confined in knitting and sweeting and cooking, they would not have even distribution. They have the more power somewhere else. Like in a factory, a boiler operator without boiler operator, you cannot operate. Without the steam operations, so women should be the boiler operator. Like a driver, you don't treat her like ordinary work. That's what we think the one side that patient on the health care. There is no health care without the women. How did medicalization comes? We have been all the time taught. These are the, like when even I was a medical student, cardiology. Oh, don't touch the ECG machine. But today, teachers, God, he does have our electrocardiogram cardiac machines. She does everything, she puts that, it's it up. Even common things she can say, what? This thing, there is the inverted key. She was not able to tell too many things. But she can do the basic work. First thing, first demedicalization came with the blood pressure machine. This most important machine, why? I said, why not give this skills to the girl? <coughs> Trainer. But what the medical profession did is they are to. They did not allow to somebody else to touch it. They said, no, so long you are not a deaf and dumb, and if you can sick, you can handle the blood pressure machine. So I think that is the first demedicalization. To handle a thermometer is the demedicalization. To hold the, to, somebody hold it to record the pulse. So that sort of thing we started in the 70s. Why is that? In best part of the world we are doing that, my neighbor, the big country, Bharat, there is a couple, Arola. He also it happens. He was also a surgeon. He tackled that and his wife. They started a program for jump cat with the community. That is the point that towards a community coming. Community has to be involved in deciding their health care, what they want and other. Most important demedicalization started by David Warner in Mexico by Pierce. Why we are doing all these things as also really Mariaga mentioned after it, these three programs are the background of WHO's help for all of our part of it. It's a great thing what Hartan Mahat did and it's a great thing. The no tribute is enough to really give you the right full place. The most key word in that case. What upset the capitalist world to what? Community. Other things than the other, but empower the community. That was the, that's why the other, David, David, I think he has written what happened afterwards and other, that I'm not going to elaborate. But what happened? At that time, even though after the we did not mention certain things, we wanted to give the immediate care. Immediately, we don't realize with our social work and social changes and all that, we will live longer. Simply to endure more misery of life. In one side, we say we are living longer than other things. Understand our misery is at the end of twice. We never thought of the NCD is not community privilege. Primary health care is not the second thing. NCD is in the part of primary health care. You have to think of that. So if we think of the primary health care, that comes the economics of health care. Unfortunately, WHO is completely mum on two things I have all the participants. Economics of health care is not been taken seriously. It's not been taken So medical education, medical profession, Totally, they never thought. Yes, I want the best for my patients. But is it affordable? Should it be the price? Is it the right price? That question never been there in there. By this, what is happening? Take the case, and people are living wrong. 
Catholic. How much a Catholic operation in a third world should do? The wealth that you put in the two lens, it is in my eyes as well. It's two dollars. Two dollars is each lens. Will anyone, you are going to get, you get ten dollars. But if your cost of production for these two dollars lens, it is the man who made the media in the small, in a bank in China, a
in Bangladesch sprechen. But Geld is producing a distant village in Bangladesh. But you know, if two estates there, if it is less than one Saka. But in Dhaka, it is sold as 60 Saka per day. Farmer is not benefited. We have been a middle class in Dhaka, maybe. But who is the public middle class? And then the same thing happening in the healthcare system. Government is wrong. Poor people is wrong. They are deprived. Doctors is not that benefited. And on the other side, the middle corporate bodies, business people. It may be a pharmaceutical company, it may be a corporate body, a hospital owners. So these are the things I think is the missing element here. And also another thing what happened since Hamdan Mother last left the picture. Everything is they have taken over. So the philanthropy. So they, they, are, they have really one bank and other they have taken. Of course, we have to give what was one great I have to give them. Uh, WHO was less vocal about the smoking. World Bank did. World Bank is more effective in persuading against the uh, smoking. So this is the only contribution I can see. But also, it is so unfortunate. One is so short sighted. One man cannot have been more important one than we can hear. They could listen, they could listen to so many thousand people free of charge. They could be educated, they missed a big opportunity to be educated. <coughs> they will be education from the ground, from the villages, from the poets of people. The wisdom, your wisdom will benefit that of the enormous.
audio audio Put microphone on that speaker. Put microphone. <laughs> 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 Just put microphone on that speaker. Oh. चेक खुले फिलहाल चेक खुले डायरेक्ट दें
and very, very valuable. We have a, I put this up mainly because I just love this photo. It's a beautiful photo of this little baby, 14 days old. But this is because, just to highlight one part of the inequities that still exist. In UNICEF, at the moment, we have a campaign that we're calling Every Child Alive. And we're highlighting newborns. It's the first 28 days of life. In this region, in South Asia, every year, one million newborns die. It's one million babies die before they reach the end of their first month of life. If by chance those babies had been born in Western Europe, the vast, vast majority of them would live. Of course, not all, but something, but something well over 90% of them would live. And of course, that's just you know, a very obvious big picture in equity. You can say the same in multiple different ways. But I think striking and, and heartbreaking that that level of inequity still exists and that the scale, one million babies in South Asia dying before they reach their first month. Of course, also looking over 40 years, we're nowhere near having had the systems that are fit for purpose around the world. There are access barriers, there's fragmentation, there's poor quality, there's rising costs and wasted resources, spending on healthcare that's impoverishing families, commercialization of health, and a shortage of health workforce and, and skill gaps within the existing health workforce. So then, as I said, the um, world met on the 25th and 26th of October in Astana, just um, a few hundred miles away from al Mahat or al Mahdi as it's now known. And the Astana Declaration um, essentially recommits the core ideas of, of al Mahat. So let me move on to, to highlight four from our perspective. Of course, everyone can look at this and then we'll find different key messages, but four things that from our perspective are particularly important in the Astana Declaration. Of course, the first is, this is obvious to all of us, but needs frequent repeating, health for all, and equity. Now, actually, in some ways, we would have liked to see more still made of this. In our view, if the aspiration is health for all and universal health coverage, we should be very deliberately starting with those who need it the most, starting with the most underserved, not having some distant aspiration that we will get there. That is, we, we really need to highlight equity as meaning that, that in our programming for UNICEF, in the way that we all work, if we, if we have an aspiration to reach those most in need, we need to do that now. The second thing is that it remakes a strong case for primary health care, which again is so fundamental to all of us that it perhaps doesn't need to be said, but a strong statement that we're convinced that strengthening primary health care is the most inclusive, effective and efficient approach to enhance people's physical and mental well-being, mental health as well as social well-being. The third thing I wanted to mention was quality. Now, quality is not something that was there in the original Armada Declaration and has really been taken on um, a new level of attention since. There it is highlighted early on in the Declaration. We envisage, we envisage primary health care and health services that are high quality and safe. And there was a recent Lancet Global Health Analysis that some of you may have seen that looked at are more lives being lost because people are not using or not able to access health services or because they do have health services but the quality is not there. This analysis found that 8.5 million deaths a year could be prevented if people had access to and were using high quality health services. And when you break that down, 3.5 million deaths were because people were not using, i.e. did not have access to um, health services. Five million deaths, people did have access to health services, but they were not of the quality to prevent them from dying. And so the key message is here, of course, 
still a very significant access problem that has not disappeared by any means. But actually now the, the greater problem is quality. We have to be very, very careful about having a double standard. We should not accept poor quality care for poor people. This issue of quality is now absolutely fundamental and I for one was very pleased to see it so prominently highlighted in the Asada Declaration. And finally, a reminder of what we all know but actually many people have forgotten in the 40 years that have passed. Healthcare is of course very important to health but it is not everything. And so this, I think, nice kind of summary graphic comes from a vision document that's tagged on to the Outstanding Declaration. And it shows at the bottom primary care and essential public health functions as the core of integrated health services. So healthcare care is there and it's important. But so too multi-sectoral policy and action and empowered people and communities. These are the three elements that the Astana Declaration and this vision document bring out as being fundamental three parts of the primary health care. So, I've talked a bit about the last 40 years. I've pulled out some of the things that we think are particularly important in the Astana Declaration. So what is now needed to make this, to make this real, to turn this declaration into reality? Again, the things I've put out here are by no means comprehensive, but just some areas that we wanted to highlight. The first is about strengthening the systems at community level. The example, and, and this doesn't just mean the, um, the healthcare services, it means strengthening everything that supports this. I, I mentioned here what UNICEF is doing, not particularly to advertise UNICEF, but just to give examples uh, of what this means. At the moment we are um, working with communities to strengthen understanding of what good primary health care looks like and so ability to demand it. <coughs> Trying to strengthen with partners social accountability and social inclusion. We do a lot of work around supply chain and procurement and making sure that the essential commodities can get to where they're most needed. We're strengthening data and information systems and we're supporting We're also getting more and more interested in how to strengthen public financial management so that we can ensure that the money that is available is put to the best possible use. We are looking at better defining and supporting governments to regulate the role of the private sector and on how we can strengthen local governance particularly in countries that are decentralizing so that a lot of power, a lot of money which is, which is great in many ways available at local level how to make sure that that is truly used to meet the needs of people. So that's the first, the strength in community-based systems. The second, we have to be very honest and say that part of the problem in the last 40 years has been that well-intentioned donors, well-intentioned partners have gone in multiple different directions and therefore what we have is fragmentation. And so a big part of the renewed promise of Astana is to address this. And it was good to see some of the big players there at the Astana meeting, the likes of Gavi and the Global Fund, who have invested hugely and are saying, we need to not put in so many different directions and not undermine domestic priorities. And how can we better do this? The third thing, political engagement, others have spoken about. We need the politicians. Of course, we all understand the case for this. There's an economic case to be made. There's also a political case to be made, which is not the same thing. Um, we all need to do our part in this, as UNICEF are taking this next year to the UN um, General Assembly. But in every country, there's, there's a need for this political engagement. Last, but by no means least, we need people to keep the expectation alive. I'm from the UK. We're very proud of our National Health Service. And when the National Health Service was founded in Britain in 1948, the founder said, the NHS will last as long as there are folk left. 
with the, with the faith to fight for it. So those of us who find ourselves as deep believers in a system that values primary care and a system that values equity, this means, this means a lot. I have not said people keeping the vision alive or people keeping the dream alive. I said expectation, because to me that's the other thing. This shouldn't, it, there's a level of urgency that needs to be renewed now that 40 years have passed. This isn't something that we can aspire to in the future. It's something that we need to expect now and that we need to work urgently on together. It was superb to be in a room with exactly these people who are working to keep this expectation alive. And so, thank you so much.
And these principles were to run through all of the programs. And this is a list of the programs. You can see there was an overwhelming concentration on maternal and child health and nutritional issues. The problems of underdevelopment. There was no mention in Alma Ata of non-communicable diseases or mental health. Now, huge problems. And in fact, there were big problems then too. So, Alma Ata was the strategy to attain health for all by the year 2000. And there's a picture of Dr. Mala. Um, and he was the one who <coughs> insisted that it was not just primary health care. The goal was health for all by the year 2000. Which is of course why we held the first PHA yeah, in the year 2000. So right at the front of the Alma Ata Declaration, but not at the Astonic, is this phrase, economic and, sentence, economic and social development based on a new international economic order is of basic importance to the fullest attainment of health for all. So this call for a new international economic order came from the group of non-aligned nations. The nations that were neither with the Soviet Union nor with the US. And you can read for yourselves what the NIEO stood for. I think it's summarized in the next slide. The rights of states and peoples who have been under colonial domination to restitution and full compensation the regulation of transnational corporations, which of course are a bigger problem now than they were even at the time of Alma Ata. Thirdly, preferential treatment for developing countries. Fourthly, transfer of new technologies and ending the waste, and we would add horrible exploitation of natural resources, which we've heard about. So, the essence of the NIEO is as relevant today, if not more relevant, as it was then, but not a whisper in a stun. So, comprehensive primary health care is at the center. So, in the declaration, it insists that comprehensiveness includes all the four components, promoted, preventive, curative, and rehabilitative services, and now we've added, quite rightly, palliative. And this is in the Astana Declaration. So, PHC wasn't only about providing basic health care. It was also about addressing the social determinants of health. And as I'll show in the next slides, that aspect has consistently and repeatedly dropped off the agenda. There was also the recognition that, and Paul referred to this, that actually primary health care properly applied would itself be a contributor to development, to empowerment, to development, and to progressing towards health for all, not just health care for all. But there was soon a split in the primary health care movement, and we in, uh, we in uh, PHM still use the term selective primary health care. Most young people don't hear that term anymore. But we think it's absolutely fundamental to understand what that is because it is reproduced repeatedly in a different form and I will try and show this. Of course its first form was UNICEF's Child Survival Revolution. And some of us at that time were practicing, I was at that time only middle aged. Now I'm nearly yeah. dead. <laughs> and, um, and 
And uh, so it focused on child survival and because of an outcry that women were neglected and nutrition was neglected, three F's were added. Go be triple F. So what's the problem? The problem isn't what selective PhD said and did. It's what it didn't do. So if you look at how would we address diarrhea comprehensively, which sadly and disgracefully remains the third commonest cause of death of children globally, even though we've known how to prevent that since the 1970s, when it was hailed by the Lancet as the most significant breakthrough in healthcare, we still find that the global coverage of oral rehydration is 40% global coverage. That's without an equity analysis. So poor children, 10% of them are getting ORT. So, what's wrong is not the O, the B, and the I, the immunization. Of course, we insist on those. But what was left out of selective primary health care were the other activities. And especially improving water sanitation and food security. And I'm afraid to say, and I'm sure Paul would agree with me, sanitation is a global disaster. There has been hardly any effort on sanitation in the last few decades. In fact, the numbers of people without sanitation have increased globally over the last few decades. And now, of course, we know that sanitation is not just about diarrhea. It's about the intrabiome about nutritional status and development of the child, adolescent, and future adults. And yet, sanitation, nobody's taking care of it. So, primary health care, for many of us, didn't demise, but it's been in the intensive care unit for a long time. <laughs> Why? Well, as Maria said, in her homily to Health and Mother, it coincided with global debt crisis, structural adjustment, and with austerity measures. And then in the late 80s, early 90s, we had health sector reform. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So, this book, which was written by myself and David Werner, David being the first author and whose name was mentioned, <coughs> on this panel, and who sadly is not here, and who should be here, who was actually the architect of many of the documents which went into PHA 1. David and I wrote this book, which goes, which goes in depth into selective PHC. And for those who can't afford it, you can download it free of the health rights website. So we then had health sector reform. I won't go into this in detail, but these are the components of health sector reform. I've highlighted some of the most important, the decentralization, most people have experienced that. Decentralization to district level, <coughs> in Africa anyway, but often without resources and without authority, and with little capacity. A core set of essential services, sometimes called the package, and working with and involving more frequently the private sector. So, what's the problem? Well, in the Bible of Health Sector Reform, the World Development Report 1993, this table, this graph, is absolutely central. I'm going to explain it for a minute. On the y-axis is the increase in disability life, adjusted life years. In other words, the health impact, if you like, of the intervention. And along the x-axis, the cost of the intervention. The most expensive being at this end. So, leukemia, treatment of leukemia, is not a good investment. It's not cost effective. But, up in the far right corner, chemotherapy for TB, and vitamin A supplementation 
are the best buys. I'm sure you've heard the term best buys. So that's fine. But what's not on there are the broader interventions. Such as water and sanitation. No cost effectiveness analysis of water and sanitation. Why? Because it's difficult to do. It's easier to evaluate hand washing. Why is it difficult to do? Because it has multiple inputs to help. It can improve hygiene practice. It can save women's time from water collection. It can contribute to increased home agricultural production. But no cost-benefit analysis done for that. So it's not part of the package. And so our governments are often strong-armed in accepting a basic package of care and always the intersectoral interventions drop off the agenda. They're not in the package. So this has mean, meant that vertical programs, fragmentation, and neglect of the social determinants have come to rule. And in fact, cost-effectiveness analysis as applied, not as a methodology itself, has undermined PHC. And this has been aggravated by changing donor funding architecture. So Paul says, well, it's good to have Gabby and the Global Fund round the table because they now accept that actually the negative aspect of their work is fragmenting health service. But some of us said this 15 years ago. Research was published on this. I was involved in some of the research more than 10 years ago. So these global health initiatives, I won't spend long on this, fund particular interventions or set up funds to fund, for example, HIV and TB. So if you come to South Africa, you will see a good HIV service, but a very poor service for NCDs, for diarrhea, for pneumonia, for malnutrition, and so on. So these are some of them. I won't spend any time, but you'll recognize some of the names, the Global Fund, PEPFAR, Gabi, World Bank's MAP, and many other. There are 150 of these global health initiatives, all funding separate interventions. They grew rapidly in the early 2000s, and the good thing about them, certainly for South Africa, was they brought new money into the HIV field. And you can see from the time that World Bank MAP was launched and the Global Fund, there was an exponential increase in funding, which was good. However, most of the work has gone to treatment. Very little to prevention, and certainly nothing to address the structural determinants, which are related to gender oppression and gender-based violence, which is why in South Africa, although we have the biggest AIDS treatment program in the world, new cases amongst young women flagline, no change because the structural determinants of those problems have not been addressed. I'm not saying they're easy to address, but we haven't really tried, at least not the big ones. <laughs> so, these GHIs have imposed big burdens on low middle income countries. And you can read that yourself, donor-driven priorities, difficulties with donor procedures, uncoordinated donor practices, excessive demands on government time, and delays in payment. In the year 2000, Tanzania had to prepare 2,400 quarterly reports on separate aid-funded projects, hosted a thousand donor visits. And this is what the supplies and logistics system in Kenya looks like. Only the supply and logistics system, just one component of the health system, a complete spaghetti with different funders on this line 
funding different parts of the supply and logistics system. And then, of course, we have the Gates Foundation. So when Bill Gates comes to a country, not only is the red carpet rolled out, but immediately he meets the president. And it's easy to see why. Over seven years, $13 billion of grants have been made. And you can see who's influencing WHO. Because WHO is the fourth largest recipient of Gates money. UNICEF's a little bit further down the list. But when I work briefly for Save the Children Fund, vaccination was the only thing. We had to write all our proposals wrapped around vaccination. Because that was what funding was for. So, this is a summary of neoliberal health reforms. You will recognize it. And we've been talking about it for a week. And at the third anniversary of Alma Ata, even WHO said the system, the health system focuses disproportionately on narrow specialized curative care, the command and control approach to disease control is focused on short-term results and, and fragments the system, and unregulated commercialization has been allowed to flourish. So, I am towards the end now. I get on to a stun. So now, despite the celebration in a stun, which I have to say was quite muted, until the Director General of CARHO gave her speech, we had a lot of blah blah and a lot of private sector representation in the plenaries, I have to say. So, the focus now is UHC, it's not PHC. So, UHC, at least defined by WHO, Universal Health Coverage, is about equity and access to health services, about quality of health services, and about financial risk protection. But, we have to ask ourselves, why is it called Universal Health Coverage? Why isn't it called universal health care? Well, I'll tell you why. I pay every month for coverage by my insurance company. Because the way UHC is being translated is actually, and I'll come to this in a minute, private insurance companies are in there up to their necks. So, in the lead up to Astana and the lead up to the high level meeting on UHC which will take place next year, there has been UHC priority setting. And they say that demand for health services may be infinite while resources are limited. And we have discussed over the last several days that resources aren't limited. They're just in the wrong place. $65 trillion untaxed in offshore accounts. I mean, why do we accept that resources are limited? Why should there be austerity globally? We know the banks are doing well. We know that they're more billionaires than they ever were. So why do we accept that resources are limited? PHM doesn't accept that resources are limited. We will fight to get redistribution of resources. So, <laughs> so at this particular influential meeting, they tried to change the SDG3 indicator for UHC. And because of protests, they were forced to go back to the original definition, but try to change it to the number of people covered by health insurance or a public health 
system. We're saying not health insurance. We're saying public funding. Yes. So, that is the declaration of Astana. I'm not going to go through it. But Bridget Lloyd, coordinator of PHM Globally, and myself, we invited onto the International Advisory Group. So, we tried to advise, but we were never asked for advice. We discovered that there were big meetings taking place of the agencies invited by WHO, the ones that can fund themselves. And when it came to Astana, I got a letter of invitation, I put it in my diary, and surprise, surprise, no funding for me. <laughs> so all the big agencies, including UNICEF, were funded by themselves. And those of us who came from civil society had to fund ourselves. And in fact, we were given these tags after we had registered. And here I am, you see. <laughs> So, it might have been a problem of the Kazakh language, but I don't think so. The VIPs and the delegates were member states and the big agencies and the private sector. The rest of us were... So, here are some excerpts. I'm almost finished, from the Astana Declaration. So, the first version of the Astana Declaration, which several people in this room saw, was really quite atrocious. So there was a lot of arguments about it, by some of us. And it did improve. It's a much improved declaration, I have to say. But there's still some problems. So the first problem is, they say, PHC is a cornerstone of a sustainable health system for universal health coverage. I thought universal health coverage was part of PHC, not the other way around. And then there was a lot about the United Nations General Assembly high-level meeting on UHC. And, I'm worried about this phrase, we will each pursue our paths to achieving UHC. So, the public sector will pursue a path and I presume the private sector will. We see that unfolding in South Africa right now. Private hospitals, private insurance. So, they acknowledge that in spite of remarkable progress, many people still have unaddressed health needs. Remaining healthy is challenging for many people particularly the poor and people in vulnerable situations. But there is no mention in the declaration of why inequity persists and why it's increasing. It's obvious to anyone who even reads the newspaper why it's increasing. Not a mention. We'll continue to address the great burden of NCDs. from tobacco use, harmful use of alcohol, unhealthy lifestyles and behaviors, and of wars, violence, and so on. But no mention of the structural determinants of these commercial drivers. No hands on the big corporates. Not mentioned. In fact, some of them were in the plenary on the podium with VIP, not others. 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 Call on all stakeholders to take joint action to build stronger and sustainable PHC towards achieving UHC. So they're saying the private sector is going to partner to reduce commercial dominance. That's a bit dangerous, I think. They say we will involve more stakeholders in the achievement of health for all, leaving no one behind while addressing 
and managing conflicts of interest? Well, I'm not so sure. I would urge you to Google Investments of the Gates Foundation. B in tobacco, alcohol, and big food. So, three principles of PHC, which we've talked about. But in the Astana Declaration, a focus on healthy lifestyles, nothing about the structural determinants of health, of ill health. PHC as a means to achieve UHC, but we think it should be the reverse. Addressing the SDGs, engaging and regulating the private sector, but at the same time avoiding conflicts of interest. No reference to new international economic order. Nothing about progressive taxation, global funding mechanisms, climate change, and so on. So, Oxfam noted in the publication a few years ago, UHC has the potential to transform the lives of millions of people by bringing life-saving health care to those who need it most. It means that all people get the treatment they need without fear of falling into poverty. Unfortunately, in the name of UHC, some donors in developing country governments are promoting health insurance schemes that exclude the majority of the people, leave the poor behind, and we heard this at one of our sessions here. From Ghana, we've heard it from Lesotho, and there are many other countries where, in fact, this is happening under our mind. So the big risk, of course, is privatization of ownership, of responsibility, look after yourself, of provision, of finance, and through markets, creating conditions where the private sector can compete with the public for government or social insurance funds. So I end with what we've been talking about all week. We know that without strong, independent civil society organization, which includes health professionals and professionals from related sectors, <coughs> students, and of course, ordinary citizens, we need to push very hard. And of course, Verkov said this a few hundred years ago, medicine is a social science and politics is nothing more than medicine on a large scale. And we have some historical antecedents. This is a poster from 1832 in London where it complains that death has been invited by the common commissioners to take up residence in Lambeth, the suburb of London. In the pest house of the metropolis, disgrace to the nation, the main thoroughfares are still without common sewers, even though the inhabitants have paid exorbitant rates from time immemorial. Unless something be speedily done, to allay the great discontent of the people, retributive justice in her salutary vengeance will commence her operations with the lamp iron and the halter, which are instruments of torture. And it's signed by Salus Populi, which was the first country circle of people's health movement. <laughs>
my camera was out of the case. So for the small as a speech Can you want to Everybody stand up? Yeah. Stretch 